Uh, just in case people are, are wondering, uh, the hashtag for this this class slash interview is uh, best places. So if you are if you are tweeting about it, make sure you include that hashtag. We'll see how many people are on Twitter here. But uh, cool, that's great. This is brought to you by Kirkland Green Tea, the finest in green tea, available at your local Costco. Costco, please send me my check now. Thank you. You were uh, you were in the Costco magazine at one point, right? Is that I was. The, yeah, that was fun. There could be something going on here, whether you think <laughs> he's joking or not. I, <laughs> I'm not That's really right. sure. Yes. Well, I happen to be. I live in Oregon and, and mostly around the Portland area. I divide my time between Portland and a small coastal community called Depot Bay. Uh, as some people say, it's a small drinking town with a fishing problem. Uh, but the um, uh, what what I uh, Portland often appears in a lot of my studies as being one of the places that's sort of on the ascendancy. Uh, there are lots of neat things happening in Portland. It's got great food. Uh, it's got a lot of fun things that are happening. It's a very livable city, and so I get a little bit of heat when Portland appears near the top, since it's sort of my hometown. Uh, but surprisingly, uh, there's not that much. It's just sort of some good natured joshing, and I think people believe. Uh, what I do is um, uh, driven by the numbers and driven by the research that myself and my team do. So uh, I'm very fortunate that way. Uh, uh, something I set up here just now is I, I thought maybe it would be helpful for you, for you Bird. I'm not sure. Um, but right. I feel like a lot of your studies do have to do with age. So we can kind of figure out what the age group is here. Um, if, uh, if people fill in their age group, if they're willing to. I promise I won't say who's, uh, who's who on here. Great. Um, well, this is, uh, this is fascinating because this way I can um, uh, be sure to be distracted while I talk and, uh, <laughs> and looking at all the bars and everything. I did have a thought the other day uh, talking about age. Uh, it used to be that I was always the youngest person in the room whenever I did something. Uh, lately, though, I just had a, another birthday, and I'm reaching the long side of, uh, of the 50s, and um, I find myself, I'm often, well, I'm usually the oldest guy in the room, and I thought, for a minute, I thought that was bad, but actually, that's really a pretty good thing. It's always good when you're young to be the youngest guy in the room. When you're old, it's always good to be the oldest guy in the room, because that means you're surrounded by lots of young people that are sort of keeping you honest and filling your head with all sorts of new things. For instance, I just learned the t term... Um, let's see, when something is, no, uh, um, oh, anyway, I have lots of, lots of hip <laughs> terms I'm, uh, I'm learning these, <laughs> learning these days, hanging out with, uh, with, uh, with guys like uh, Koichi here. I appreciate you thinking I'm hip, but maybe, uh, I think I'm, I'm <laughs> heading to the older side as well. Uh, well, let's see, while we're, uh, while we're asking kind of the, the first initial questions, I just wanted to see what kind of things uh, the people here are interested in, in terms of uh, what what Bert does or his uh, his business, um, or or just like what what brought you here in the first place? If you're if you're an entrepreneur or if you wanted to start your own business or um, you're interested in data collection studies, things like that. Uh, so if you could type that type that in the chat box while we're going over the first few questions here, and then we'll uh, we can circle back to those or keep those in mind as we're going through. Um, so just, I guess, kind of the really standard questions, Bert. Um, what, uh, what school did you graduate from and what is your degree? And uh, how did that get you to best places? Well, uh, I graduated from Oregon State University after traveling all around as a kid. My dad was in the Navy. And I ended up uh, in uh, Corvallis, Oregon. And I think I was tired of moving around. I was too clueless to know any better uh, that there were other universities. I mean, I was young and pretty clueless, really clueless. So I went to Oregon State University. I graduated, graduated in accounting and also industrial engineering, thinking that those would be pretty good ways to find a job. So uh, out of school, I went and uh, uh, went to work for some CPA firms. And I was on my track to getting a CPA my uh, certificate and I passed all the uh, the grueling exams, the three-day exams for getting my, my uh, um, CPA certificate and then I said mm, no not really what I want to do and I found I was um, I got involved in programming computers and uh, then I had my own software company one thing led to another uh, 
I had a story in USA Today on one of the front pages and one of the sections about uh, some software I'd written to help people find their best place to live. And it, um, it, it sort of had a bunch of resonance. And um, uh, I started doing studies. Money Magazine approached me to uh, do a study for them for their best places to live. And so I created that feature for them. In fact, that was the first study I did that appeared in Michael Moore's film, uh, Roger and Me, where we found uh, Flint, Michigan to be the most unlivable city, the worst place to live in the United States. Uh, and just an aside, I talked to Michael a couple of years ago and I apologized for finding uh, Flint or naming it as the worst place. And he said, no, no, that was the best thing you could have done. I've been trying to tell everybody how bad things were in Flint and your study came out was the <laughs> worst place in the country to live. It was perfect. So <laughs> it suited his purpose very well and, and uh, I'm glad he was grateful for it. But I always felt a little bad about it. You, but you, if you see the film Roger and Me, which I still think is his best work, uh, you'll see what the, the folks in, in Flint thought about the study. <laughs> That's great. That was a great impression as well. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, so that's, uh, that's, that's awesome. And so actually, some, I'm sure some people here, uh, they don't know what Best Places is, and we're, we're talking about it as if they do. Can you kind of explain what Best Places is as a whole? I know there's multiple facets to the, to the company as well. There are. There are. OK, there'll be a test afterwards. There are actually five. We have five of them. They're the five fingers of, of and then they form the mighty fist, the mighty Best Places fist of, of power. Uh, actually not, but I'm just joking. Uh, what they are basically is, is, first of all, I write books on best places. I have a couple that John Wiley um, published, and uh, they said they're best sellers, so that's cool. Uh, I was on the Today Show uh, introducing one of those a couple of years ago. Um, and let's see, uh, we also have a website, bestplaces.net. We get about 20,000 visitors a day, and uh, it's been very successful, and uh, it's been a great resource. It seems I'm always meeting people, and they say, oh yeah, I moved here because of your website, or something like that, so it's always a really pleasant surprise. Uh, the sec a third thing that we do is we license our data to lots of folks like uh, AOL and Yahoo and MSN. They all use our data. Uh, we also do studies, like the one I mentioned for Money Magazine. Um, and we have, let's, oh, on the cover, I think AARP Magazine this month. Uh, Bruce, the, the boss, is on the cover, but right next to boss, uh, the boss is Best Places to Live. And uh, that's a cover story that we did for AARP, and we do a bunch of those. Finally, we do studies for lots of different companies, like um, McDonald's uh, asked us a, a month or two ago to find the happiest cities for families because the Happy Meal had the 30th anniversary and as part of that they wanted to do a study where the happiest places were for, for families. So those are the five things that we do and the neat thing is that they're all very symbiotic and uh, meaning that they all sort of contribute to each other. Um, sometimes it gets so busy I'd like to pair off some of those and maybe not do them but I find they all really relate and that's part of the business that that we have uh, is that the we appear on uh, a website um, well let's say McDonald's we get promoted as part of a million dollar advertising campaign they promote what we do uh, and our name goes out and they use my name to help promote their product, and it just keeps building one after the other like that. It's a very cool thing. Awesome. Do you have a do you have a favorite study that you've done? Well, I can tell you, uh, no, I, I don't have a favorite one. Um, I would say though that one of the most popular ones that we've done recently is stressful cities, and we did that a few years ago, and uh, that wasn't sponsored by anybody. We just did that, and. Um, I think that we're going to roll that out again because things are very stressful. And with our website, we collected a lot of information from people. About 11,000 people responded to a survey about how they're reacting to, um, to the current economic crisis. Things are bad out there, really bad, and it was very sobering to hear some of the comments. So we're going to put, present that as part of our stressful cities and, uh, and go with that. That is a, that's a good, good uh, study to do right now. Yeah, I got a whole bunch of response. In fact, I even did a, um, a, a talk show, uh, a call-in show, radio talk show in Venezuela, and they translated. Also, the BBC called up about that. So it's been pretty interesting. So I can't believe Tacoma. That's, uh... mm -hmm. 
<laughs> Tacoma. Yeah, that's right. It was, yeah, it was Tacoma. And uh, well, that when that study came out, shortly I think after that, let's see, the police chief was indicted for something. Then there was the case of some person who somebody with his common law wife and their children. The guy drove off, and I think he shot somebody. He was driving with the family in the car. He ran into something, then tried to set everybody on fire. I mean, it was just like a giant bunch of mayhem. And man, if that doesn't tell you about stress or whatever, I don't know what would. But yeah, I can cool. totally. I well, I grew up in uh, in Olympia, Washington, which I believe was the best place to retire, medium-sized city, something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what. I, that's <laughs> but yeah, what I could I can totally see Tacoma <laughs> as being a very stressful place to live. And I think Solar is in Seattle, right? Oh, yeah, you said that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I, I agree. And it also smells funny there. So, the, oh, Tacoma, Seattle. the aroma of Tacoma. Yeah. Oh, Tacoma. I've got to be stressful. It does. But tell you what, Tacoma is, is coming back. Basically, uh, in the Seattle area, uh, you're, you're bounded by Puget Sound on one side and of course Lake Washington on the other. Traffic is terrible. When I had meetings up in Microsoft, everybody would be looking at the um, at their watch. In fact, whenever I go up to Seattle, everybody, even on the weekend, you're going to a party or something, people are up there, they're looking at the watch, they're, they're wondering what the traffic is like on the 405 or the I-5 or whatever. There's a real level of anxiety all the time about where you have to go, what time it is, and how are you going to get there, and what the traffic is going to be like. So basically, a lot of the people are moving south uh, to Tacoma. I wouldn't say a lot of people. It's not like a migration or something. But when people have a chance, uh, it's cheaper in Tacoma, uh, and um, it's getting too crowded in that sort of the central corridor. And uh, so people are looking for more affordable choices. Tacoma is going to get better and better. This is what how cities. Like I guess it, it can't get any worse. So. Uh. Oh, it could always get worse, but uh, yeah, <laughs> it, yeah. Um, it's it, it is interesting. Seattle was often in our best places to live. Uh, they would always rank in the top ten, maybe in the nineties. But I think what's happened recently is that the uh, uh, for the past ten. 12 years, uh, the traffic has gotten so bad, uh, and the, it's gotten less affordable as more people have discovered it, and uh, so it's sort of uh, been knocked down a few pegs. So I, I guess going off from there, like where where should these people be living? Uh, I know not everyone here is in the U.S., but uh, uh, well. This is where I think it, it gets interesting. For instance, there was a study that was just uh, Wall Street Journal did one. Uh, where they asked uh, some notables uh, about where people should, uh, the best places for young, um, uh, for recent graduates, and that was it. Well, they named places, and Portland was like number four. Uh, Boulder was another one in conjunction with Denver. Um, let's see, where else were they? Washington, D.C., of course, uh, was, was way up there, I think, uh, maybe tied for first. but. What I've found is that young people, when they graduate from school, they tend to go to a large place to sort of establish their career. Portland is sort of a mid-sized, second-tier city. It's a very cool place to live, but only if you've got a job. And that's part of the problem. A lot of people are moving to Portland because it's so neat to, uh, to live, uh, live in, but they're having trouble finding jobs. And that's why Portland has one of the highest unemployment rates for any city its size. A lot of people are moving here, they can't find a job. And and that's a problem. And so what happens is people go to the New York, uh, the LA, Chicago, Atlanta, those larger places and they're establishing their career, they're getting a job in, in uh, whatever their field is. Then they can move to Portland and they have the credentials. I spoke with a guy um, at a local shoot. I live in this uh, neighborhood here, East Moreland in Portland. Uh, that has a lot of um, movies that are shot here because it's a tree lined, it's very pretty, and the streets are curved. And from a movie standpoint, you want curved streets so you don't have to clear everybody off way, way down uh, into infinity. Uh, just a sidelight about, about movie making. But anyway, this guy is an assistant director, 
and he moved up from LA recently and he was a small fish in a big pond LA but he established his credentials as he said he got his card and it might be an actual card that he gets uh, with his credentials and now he's doing uh, he's shooting uh, doing commercial uh, work for you know, corporate films uh, he's shooting commercials uh, when a Hollywood production comes to town uh, he's helping with that uh, for instance leverage is being shot here in Portland that's a um, uh, film with uh, or a, a TV series with Timothy Hutton that's being shot in Portland so he, he finds work there he wanted a good quality of life to raise his kids he's about in his early 30s didn't want to raise him in LA just too much too much craziness too much uh, time commuting that sort of thing loves the quality of life established his career in a big city moved up here that's what we find is much more the case where people sort of take that arc they, they spend a lot of time starving in a place like New York or LA, establishing their credential, then they might hook up, they meet a significant other, get married, have kids, whatever, move to a place like Boulder, Portland, Austin, whatever, cooler, hipper, um, sort of fun, great quality of life, dial back on the career a little bit and sort of up the quality of life and uh, think about launching into the next part of their life. Sorry, long answer. That's really interesting. Oh, you're just saying. So I mean, I already knew that Portland is a great place to live. So, it's a, um, okay, great. Uh, maybe we can uh, take a look at some of the the questions that people asked here. Cool. Should I be um, should I be paying attention to this little thing down on the bottom there because I it's, I want to give eye contact, but I can't do that at the same time. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I'm uh, I'm grabbing all the questions and moving them to the middle here so that uh, we can we can look at them later. So people, if you if you have questions, feel free to ask them, and I'll and I'll add them to the center, and then we can answer them later. Great. So it looks like there's a lot of interest in interest in how you collect your data. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if that means the on the website or or on the studies or both. Uh, maybe you guys can clarify in the chat box. But well, how I I do the research. I've got it's a small company. Uh, and uh, we got about five people that are helping me all together. Some, uh, one of my guys is working on the website. Another one, is, well, he's doing sort of the network infrastructure. Uh, another one is doing the development of the website uh, full time. Uh, I've got a couple of people help, helping gather data and processing it, and um, taking care of comments on the web and that sort of thing. So. Uh, Again, it's a very small um, small business, but the neat thing about a small business, it's also very efficient, so we're able to react pretty quickly to everything, and we get a lot done. And here's a sidelight. So all you folks with small businesses, here's how you answer the question. You seem to be a small business. A lot of times you're approached by a big business, like we've, we've been approached by Microsoft and Intel and all these other companies to do business with them. and as part of their due diligence they want to find out about you right so what happens is they say well you seem to be pretty small and you you're seems like you're doing a lot with with only a few people here's my response uh, we say that yes we've taken a look at other firms and it seems like all the work in any company all the work is only done by four or five people and we just got rid of everybody else <laughs> that uh, that wasn't contributing that always gets a big laugh and it's the end of the discussion. So um, what we found is that it must be a universal truth. And um, so you, if anybody asks you and you have a small company, uh, just tell them that. It, in any company, there are only a few people that do all the work. And I, it must be true. So anyway, what we do is we do a lot of research on the web, uh, a lot of research from all different sources, uh, not just the web, but we'll also get it different ways. I gotta say it's a lot easier now. A lot of the information that we gather is in electronic form where 20 years ago it wasn't, uh, and it's a lot easier to process. Um, so basically that's how, how we we basically know where everything is and we can collect it at a, on, a regular, on a regular basis. Um, we, have a, we have another question here from Ron. Uh, Ron was wondering how you essentially weigh one set of information against other types of data that might seem contradictory. Well, it's not contradictory uh, because what happens is in the real world, 
you're always weighting things which are more important. For instance, if you were going to say, um, you know, what do you want to do there every, today or whatever, you have lots of choices and you have to make some choices. And that's part of the thing. You can't get caught up. I can't get caught up with saying, oh, there are too many choices. I have to try and winnow the choices down to just a few and then make some, some decisions and figure out which is more important. For instance, if you wanted to live in a, let's say you wanted to live in a, a, a great place that has great uh, arts and culture and you wanted a low crime rate, you wanted it to be safe. Well, you got to make some choices. For instance, you can live in St. Cloud, Minnesota, which has one of the lowest crime rates uh, for, of a, of a medium-sized or small metro area. In fact, I talked to someone who's in corrections uh, there, means he worked in the, the jail or the prison or whatever they have there. He never locked his <laughs> he never locked his door at all, so that gives you an idea. Or you can live in New York City, which has a pretty high crime rate, not too high for a large city, but it does have its crime, and you can you can opt to stay out of Central Park or some of the w less savory parts of town. So you got to make some choices. Now, somewhere in the middle, maybe that means you live in um, I don't know uh, Baltimore, Cleveland, or something like that that has some decent arts and culture. Uh, that but doesn't have a high crime rate as, as, as New York. There are always choices you got to make and just realize that um, you know you disclose them uh, and you try and make ones that are valid. Uh, for instance if you were going to do something on um, where we're going to do a study here soon for the safest cities uh, to live uh, for farmers insurance and so we're going to look at what is what has to do with safety. Now, these days Safety is not so much crime. Crime is not the big problem like it was in the 90s. It's going to be having a job because part of being safe or secure, I guess the, really the function, the, 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 of the, the focus of the study is going to be security and a lot of security is having a job. So looking at jobs is going to be pretty crucial. So I hope that answers your question. Um. So, so yeah, so I mean, you, you're mentioning uh, a lot, of, a lot of the different studies that you've done, and you know all these big names that you've worked with, and you know I, I I've gotten, I've had the honor of working with you before as well. So like I know that you're uh, a master at PR, and that uh, you're you're really good at it. Even though you know you're running the business, um, you do all the PR on your own. Do you have any uh, recommendations to someone who's interested in PR or or starting their business, or were you just I, lucky? I really or, have. I'm sure there's lots of skill involved. No, uh, what, what, okay, I was really lucky, and I, I tell you what, I think in life, um, there's a lot of luck, and you just have to take advantage of what is, what comes your way, and be really open to anything that's out there, so do lots of things, it's like getting up um, at to the plate, and, and swing the bat, to use sort of a baseball metaphor, you have to take a lot of swings, of the bat in order to connect. Even your most successful hitters, they might be, might get a hit one out of three times. And, but what you have to do is you have to make, take a lot of swings, you have to do a lot of things, put out a lot of feelers. You just can't put all your eggs in one basket, is, I guess is what I'm saying. So, yeah, I'm, I got very lucky in what I was doing and I've been able to have all of this exposure. For instance, if you go into the, um, uh, into Google or a search engine and type in best places, you'll find my site to be number one. Uh, if you type in cost of living, we're number one as well. Not quite sure how that happened, but I'll take it. Uh, so I'll tell you, the really important thing is PR and what you should do, and PR stands for public relations. There's advertising and there's PR, and it all falls under the big umbrella of marketing. I would go out and look for a book, go to the library, don't have to spend any money, go to the library and get a book by Al Reese. Al, first name, A-L, last name Reese, R-I-E-S. And uh, one of the books is like the 22 Immutable Laws of Branding. He's a PR guy. This is invaluable and I, it will probably change the way you look and the way you do business because what you realize is people will not listen to advertising anymore. Everything I've done, I haven't spent a nickel on advertising. But for instance, I got a great article in the New York Times two years ago. I was on the cover of, of the real estate section in the Sunday Times, two-page article, 
just a wonderful article and a tremendous um, endorsement of, of basically what I do. And it was all about Bert, the guy who picks the best places to live. So it's all about PR. And the fact is that really nobody believes advertising these days, but people do believe stuff that comes from other sources. For instance, if a friend tells you about what's a great place to live, or if you should check out a website, if you read an article about it, if you see a review, if you see things that sort of in the news or in the editorial context, and that's why I'm hired by companies like McDonald's or whatever to raise them above the clutter. Sure, they could buy a lot of advertising space, but instead what they do is they come to me and use my visibility to get them into the editorial space, and anyone can do this. Uh, and so that's why you should really read one of these books by Al Reese and think about how you, whatever your business is, how you can get away from advertising and into PR and putting out information about yourself. It all ties in really well to uh, social networking that's come up recently. But that's what it's all about. And that's, I guess, if there's any big takeaway in business, I would say that's it. Um, learn to build your own brand and I guess branding is, is kind of almost trite because that's uh, all, uh, the, the watchword for all the folks in advertising and marketing. But branding is just an emotional connection. You have to let people make an emotional connection with you. That's what it's all about. So you've probably, uh, you've probably had to build a lot of relationships with uh, people in the media and uh, other, other places like that. Do you have any tips or tricks, or I guess tricks is a bad word for uh, relationship building, but uh, do you have any tips in terms of how to build those relationships with people in the media, um, how to get cycled around? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Dealing with the media, realize that these, uh, basically the media is, is, is a bunch of reporters and what they are looking for is something to report about, something interesting, something upbeat, uh, something that will make their job easier, which is trying to get something noteworthy out there you have to provide something noteworthy to them and you have to do it in a way that is not uh, overtly uh, sales related you and um, so what it is is presenting to them information that they can use and try and present to them a story that they can use without uh, sounding like it's a, a commercial going on the media is very very sensitive to that right now so when we go on the air and I'll do um, for instance uh, a series uh, of morning shows. Uh, it's called a satellite media tour. Uh, if it's on TV or it's called a radio media tour if I do a bunch of radio stations uh, in the morning uh, or during the day. And what I'll have to do is I'll have to present the story and I can't overtly talk about my client uh, if it's on behalf of a client uh, because that is not allowed. But basically we're presenting something that they can use, something that they can share and when you do that, you are then uh, recognized as a, an authority, as someone that they can use to go back to. And one thing the media does often is recycles the same people over and over again. That's why you see the same people on the news all the time. They know that they deliver a good story uh, and it's interesting, so they'll go back to them again and again. Um. Cool. Uh, do you have any uh, particular favorites in terms of what shows you've been on on television? Anything that stood out? That was a lot of fun. Oh, let's. Oh, I remember one. Uh, it was. Let's see. On TV. I, I, well, <laughs> there was. There was. Uh, I was doing. Uh, I was down in San Francisco doing a, a, a series of TV appearances for Intel. Uh, this was the most unwired cities. And because they, uh, it was all about the Centrino Wi-Fi built into laptops, and so they wanted wired, but they want. Uh, it was a sort of a takeoff on wired cities, but unwired, which cities had were making the most use of, of Wi-Fi when Wi-Fi wasn't as popular as it was now. There was, uh, I was on some. Uh, I think we looked at a hundred different major metro areas, and there was one I spoke to. I forget where it was, maybe Toledo or, or some Ohio or something like that they were number 99 on the list and so I gave the story and said so they asked it so how did we rank how did we rank uh, this year I said well you were 99 out of 100 I said well 
what were we last year? I said, well, you were 100. Then there was this pause, this dead air, and they said, and so I, I jumped in and I said, well, look on the bright side and <laughs> you'll be number one in 100 years. <laughs> Uh, fortunately, they took it uh, with uh, with humor, uh, and it, Intel wasn't upset about it either. I think uh, I think we actually lost you during the, the last part of the the story, right? Right when uh, you said, um, or they asked, uh, "What were we last year?" Uh -huh. Said ninety nine, and that's right. Oh, right. Well, last right, right last year. It, uh, this the year the year that we, I was uh, on on the new uh, on the. Um, uh, getting interviewed, there were 99. The previous year, there were number 100. So I, uh, then there was this sort of this flat, this dead air, the silence. They didn't know what to say. So I said, "Well, look on the bright side. You'll be number one in 100 years <laughs> at this rate." And um, fortunately, they laughed. They thought it was pretty funny. Intel thought it was pretty funny too. So <laughs> it wasn't all bad. So if you uh, so you, so you wouldn't want to, you wouldn't be able to get your work done in uh, Ohio. Then it sounds like if you if you brought your laptop. Or you'd have to do it offline. Uh, well, I'm sure the nice thing, well, things right now have changed so much in the, like the three years since we did this. Oh, one of my favorite ones was I was on um, Ed McMahon's radio show. And so uh, during a uh, commercial break, I said, Ed, I said, I got to ask, do you think you could do it for me? He said, sure. He said, here's Bert. <laughs> so I got a shout out from Ed McMahon. For, for those of us, including myself, who are, who are not sure who Ed McMahon is, is that a... <laughs> I've heard the name before. Maybe I'm the only one here. Uh, okay, Ed McMahon. Uh, he uh, was Johnny Carson's oh, sidekick for okay. many years. <laughs> Tonight's yeah. show. I, I, I know who you're talking about. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah, that was very cool. Um, one thing that is neat is that... Uh, <laughs> There are so many people that depend on the site and use it for information. It's really sort of uh, very humbling uh, to put out this information and have this sort of resource and be able to help people. So it's it's always um, it's it sort of grounds me and uh, makes me uh, very uh, uh, intent on 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 trying to help people. So it's a very cool thing I'm able to do. I think, uh, I, like, was this is this something that you've always been passionate about, and, uh, or is it just something no, you kind of? No, I mean, I've been doing this for. This is like, like I said, something I, I fell into. I happened to do this. Uh, this is something that really turned out to be very fortunate. Just I, like I said, take lots of swings at the plate, and maybe you'll connect. I was writing some software. I did some software applications. I did this. I thought it'd be pretty cool to do a um, uh, a, 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 a software program that would let people find their own best place to live instead of studies that said definitely here Pittsburgh is the best. Uh, this was a, an early sort of um, look at uh, artificial intelligence, sort of soft logic uh, to uh, fuzzy logic kind of thing to to help people. Uh, uh, use their preferences to find where to live and then one call after another started happening I put things on the internet uh, more stuff happened uh, by putting it out there for free and now I'm at the place where basically I don't have to call people they call me because they know what what we do and they want to be a part of it so it's just been really wonderful very cool. great that's awesome um, and, and for those of you who don't know who are living in the US uh, Sperling's Best Places, which is bestplaces.net, has some great tools like the Find Your Best Place quiz. Uh, I think there's, it looks like something new here, the Tools tab. Uh, I haven't seen that before, where you yeah. can actually put in different criteria right. to, to figure out. Right. Yeah, it's Make Your Own List. This is in response to a lot of questions that we've had, a lot of demand for it. Um, interesting, we get calls uh, for information, and we learned that the, I got a call from the NSA, the National Security Agency, is using it for something. Uh, the Department for Homeland Security, and um, so our stuff. Who knows where it will end up being used? Um, okay, I think I did this study before, and I think it just put me like right back in Portland, where I was at the time. So it uh, <laughs> it worked out pretty well. Hey, 
you can telecommute. Right. Yes. Oh, that's <laughs> another thing. I did. I did, we did a study on telecommuting, and I really think uh, telecommuting is going to be very big. Uh, all, all the everything is in place, uh, but right now there's just a lot of uh, inertia from employers, and I think employers feel that well, people are just not going to be very diligent about doing the uh, doing their work. But really, if people uh, look, let's say people just the whole notion of getting in the car, getting dressed, parking driving, everything involved, most people spend at least an hour commuting each way, no matter how close you live. And many people are, uh, are farther than that. The savings are unbelievable. In fact, IBM Canada had uh, some studies looking at the efficiencies, and they found that people were actually more efficient and more productive by telecommuting than not. So I look at this as being a very big thing coming soon, and it could actually help the livability. I noticed one comment that someone had on their chat room about someone living in a remote town in uh, Canada, and uh, but there were no jobs. I, I can see the day quite soon where jobs are going to be much more widespread, much more accessible. In fact, uh, in, uh, in the little town uh, where I live in Depot Bay, there's a fellow who lives there and he telecommutes to uh, work on the bank mainframes of I think it's Morgan Stanley or uh, or JP Morgan Chase um, back in Baltimore and maybe once a month he'll fly back there for some meetings but it's amazing a person can be anywhere these days it's just up to the employers now to to make it happen totally. there's like platforms forums like this totally make it Possible Skype is great. You know, you can do uh, virtual communication that way. That's Absolutely. And by the way, I think Edufire is on the cutting <laughs> edge. And in fact, Edufire will soon be acquiring Google in order to bring their platform to the rest of the world. <laughs> I see that day coming soon. Can I have my <laughs> check? Can I have my yes, check? It's now? in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's, great. that's true. I, I don't write the checks. Uh, well, did I say that right? Because I, I can't quite read the email you sent me. <laughs> so yes, uh, I wrote it in wingdings for a, for a reason. <laughs> right. Well, no, no, actually, no. I I uh, I I just wanted to clarify. I'm just joking, of course. Edu Fire did not ask me to say <laughs> that or anything like that. Just for some people that maybe didn't catch the the joke or if it didn't come across well. But I I think platforms like this are going to be increasingly popular and um, certainly uh, uh, it's going to do a long way to making things people more productive more efficient it's going to go a long way towards saving the planet when you look at the um, uh, amount of, uh, of, of resources it would save uh, by people not driving as much the only thing is social interaction uh, there's something wonderful about being able to sit down across somebody and being able to uh, Pack, uh, pick up on every little gesture, nuance uh, uh, of what they're saying. Well, actually, so best places, uh, everyone telecommutes at best places, right? That's right. Yeah, everybody. <laughs> no, I'm, sit <laughs> I'm sitting in my home office here in Portland, and Al's uh, in uh, Vancouver, uh, Washington, and um, uh, Brad is uh, on his farm in uh, Colton. It's about 20 miles away, and uh, Anyway, uh, it's, uh, it's 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 pretty uh, it's it's very nice. Any uh, I guess for for people who um, are are interested in telecommuting or running a business where you know there's no actual office physical space, do you have any recommendations or anything that you've learned from uh, running everything virtually? Wow, um, no, uh, I guess. I would be the last person. I'm not a very good manager at all. I think what I do is I do s studies and I do my work well and everything like that and I really enjoy what I'm doing. I think I'm like a lousy manager uh, because what I do is I say, well, this is what needs to be done. Now please uh, go away so you can do it and I can do my stuff and then let's meet a while later and see how we're doing. I don't know. I don't even know if that's a management style or it's a <laughs> it's it's just a non-style. So 
you know, there are different ways of doing it and different people. I guess the, the big trick is to try and, and hire people that work well by themselves and, and don't, have, don't need a lot of direction. And, you know, that's really the hardest thing I find is to find people that have, oh, I guess some sort of vision that can put things together. I think a lot of people out there can do a good job if you tell them exactly what to do, but that's the hardest thing to find are people who are really focused uh, and uh, are able to take lots of different um, information and connect them in a larger way. And so that's that's what I do and that's what we do with our, our little business here. And so um, that's, I think, very difficult to find. And that's the value of a liberal arts education. For instance, all you folks that had a graduated in uh, Greek philosophy or, or uh, ancient Greek literature or something like that, that really doesn't matter to me. The most important thing is to be able to read and understand something, to um, uh, be able to speak well, uh, to communicate, being able to write well, and being able to um, create ideas uh, that use a lot of different um, oh you're, I guess you're able to uh, boy I just cannot speak well anyway able to create ideas drawing from many different sources and establish something new out of that that's the most valuable thing and I think that's what real employers look for the ones that are interested in creative things like the folks at Google or maybe an ad agency like here in Portland, Wyden and Kennedy or whatever, they're looking for people who can really create things um, out of many different uh, viewpoints and sources. So I think uh, a lot of people here are probably uh, some kind of entrepreneur or, or interested in starting a business. Do you have any recommendations for those people, like whether it's you know things you did wrong or things you did right? Um, so that people uh, can do the right thing and, and not have as much trouble? Okay, I guess I would say what you need to do is uh, do something, do many things, do them all the time, do something you love, um, try to make yourself known, and that's where social networking goes in well, uh, to try and make people aware of what you're doing. The best thing is I find selling very, very difficult. I think a lot of people do, making cold calls. What you have to do is make yourself available to be found so when people have the need, they come to you and know where to find you. It's very, very difficult to sell to someone when they're not ready uh, and when they don't need something. So then the trick is to make them aware or make them be able to find you when they are ready to buy something then you can spend all your time providing what they need instead of trying to talk them into something they don't really need. So I guess Great that's advice. it. Um, we do have a bunch of questions in the middle part here. Uh, I've made it bigger so it's easier to see. Uh, maybe did you want to take a look at these and see which ones you want to answer? Sure. Uh, causation versus correlation. Somebody brought that up. Salar. Great question. And oh, by the way, when you talk to the media, you'll find a lot of people say, oh, that's a great question. I was advised only use that once per interview because otherwise you sound like an idiot. There's <laughs> because everything cannot be a great question. And then you just sound like you're uh, sort of a tool trying to suck up to the interviewer. But th that's a good question anyway. Causation versus correlation. For instance, there's so much out there. They say, well, for instance, um, let's say uh, there, one of the popular ones these days is uh, sprawl and obesity. For instance, um, a lot, it, there's a high correlation between obesity and sprawl. Places that have a lot of sprawl, say like Houston, Texas, are also places with, where people are overweight and obese. And some people say, ah, sprawl causes obesity. Well, not necessarily, and there really hasn't been shown there. What you'd have to do is a longitudinal study saying if someone who has a certain body mass index, a BMI, moves to a place with lots of sprawl, are they going to become fatter? Uh, so you have to look for something along those lines. In fact, uh, 
uh, a mutual friend of ours, Adam, had the best uh, the best example of the fallacy of causation and correlation. Just because something ha two things happen together doesn't mean one causes the other. Um, his uh, his um, brother-in-law lived uh, lives in the southern part of the San Francisco Bay, where they have a lot of windmills up on the ridge. And uh, a new resident uh, to the neighborhood um, moved uh, had had recently moved in, and and so he he asked her, "How do you like living here?" And she said, "Oh, it's really it's really nice here, but sometimes it's just so windy. I wish they would turn off those fans." <laughs> so. And to her, this made absolute complete sense because it was windy and the big fans were turning. Of course, there were uh, the wind turbines and the wind was turning the fans, but the the correlation was, was pretty precise. It was just the causation that was a problem. Uh, how old was this person that, uh, that said this? <laughs> Too old. Oh, yeah, I don't know. She was uh, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the homeowners there, so... <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty pretty scary. Uh, another Ron says, um, "What do cities need to develop in order to improve their livability?" Well, you know that's a big question these days. A lot of cities are looking for ways to become more livable because they look at this as some sort of like golden magnet that are, is going to attract the young and the hip and make life better uh, better for everybody. It's it's they're going to become. Uh, uh, appealing and popular and uh, it'll be the end of all their problems. I think cities evolve uh, in a very very complex ways. I mean you can there are just so many different ways. What I guess what I would do is try to um, for for instance here in, in, in Portland and you could say this is true for maybe places like Buffalo uh, where they're trying to engage people to do creative things uh, I think the answer is homegrown businesses as opposed to tax credits and trying to get some uh, telemarketing place, uh, some call center to come in because those places are going to be gone as soon as the tax credits um, run out or they're going to move somewhere else. So I would say uh, for keeping the young people there and trying to grow businesses is to have some sort of um, stimulus or credits or free office space or no taxes up to a million dollars in income or something to let these young people do what they do get out of their way they're gonna do things that no one has dreamed of before and you want them to do it in your city uh, because they're gonna come up with some really interesting fascinating things maybe in 5, 10, 15 years so you want to try and promote that you want to try and encourage that so try and make it as easy as possible, then stay out of the way, let it happen, amazing things are going to happen sooner or later. Those are lots of swings at the plate from lots of people, uh, so that falls in with that theory of mine. Let's see what we have. Uh, what, do we, what do I recommend from Al Reese? The 22 Immutable Laws of Branding, Positioning, uh, or which of Al Reese's books? Good question. Al Reese, um, I think, you know, just like everybody has a, a one great movie in them or, or a script or something, Al Reese basically says the same things in a lot of his books. I think the 22 Immutable Laws of Branding is really good. Uh, that's a good place to start, but he often says the same things in a lot of his books. So you can just pick up one of them, but I like 22 Immutable Laws. Uh, what was said earlier is still true now, uh, and it, it has some good insights. Oh, uh, let's see. Is it Hari says, uh, what are the trends you've noticed in terms of what people value when looking for a place? Um, and do you, f do you find those are things that really make those people happy? Well, I don't know if they're doing it to be happy. I think they're doing it to try and, well, I have this theory about people who are not happy. It, it, and <laughs> maybe I'm as unhappy as anybody else. I mean, I was born in Brooklyn and my parents are Scandinavian, so hey, <laughs> if that isn't unhappy, I don't know what is. But anyway, um, so I would say that basically unhappy people who are looking for something to make them happy, they're still going to be unhappy because basically they're externally motivated. But what people are looking for for quality of life or a place to live, 
are um, uh, it changes. For instance, right now it's a job. People need jobs, and things are brutal out there. I don't. The, what the politicians are saying and what they're saying on the news, I think, is wrong. I think things are a lot worse. I think things are bad out there. They're going to get uglier, and I think it's tragic. I think it's a um, uh, almost sinful to be talking about a recovery that only is talking about the recovery of the stock market and not a recovery for providing jobs for people. Uh, people come number one. But anyway, uh, for instance, in the 90s, uh, high crime rates. People want a place with low crime. Late 90s, there was a bubble with kids getting into schools, uh, going to young school-age children, people looking for a place with great schools. Um, housing uh, got more and more expensive, less affordable. Uh, so in about, say, in the mid-century, uh, in the mid-2000, 2005, 2006, people wanted an affordable place to live as the housing bubble was happening. So, uh, and then uh, around 2000, after the tech wreck, 2001, people wanted a place uh, to find a job again. So basically, there have been things that change as, uh, as the economy, as society changes. This always changes, and that's what we dial into our studies to, to find, help find the best places to live. Salar asks, how has my CPA experience helped you? None. Zero. <laughs> Big waste of time. Um, well, maybe as far as analysis, but hey, I probably had that sort of uh, uh, weird bent towards numbers and, and that sort of thing already. Um, it was sort of interesting, I guess, for a while, but I'm happy to make the plunge and do something completely different. I got very lucky. I'm the first person to say I'm a very lucky person to be able to sort of end up where I am. Uh, having made lots of mistakes, but part of it is just because I've done lots of things and been able to sort of focus, find the things that uh, were um, were sort of connecting, and take advantage of them. And again, my theory of take lots of swings at the plate. Maybe you'll connect with one or two of them. Uh, Brad Brady says, "Is Portland a good place to start up?" Uh, I like a business, I guess. Ugh. Economy is kind of brutal. I wouldn't start a restaurant. I wouldn't start something there. On the other hand, there are lots of really creative people here, lots of creative young people um, that are looking for things to do, lots of to, to be part of your team, to be part of your vision. Uh, that is a very good thing. The important thing is, do you have enough resources that you can live maybe two years while you're starting something up? Uh, it, it's kind of hard to get a job as a barista or something like that at Starbucks and oh by the way uh, develop a startup on the side. You can do it uh, but you've, you're gonna have to hold down two jobs. Uh, do we ever cover best accessible places? Boy that's a good one for users of wheelchairs, site issues. That would be good. That would really be good. We do have, uh, we do look at um, mobility issues uh, for uh, say elderly. Uh, looking at the vans that are available uh, in the various cities uh, and looking at that as a per capita basis. But no, that's, that's, that's a pretty good one. Um, I wouldn't know where to start as far as the um, getting that information. If someone has that information as a source, if someone has sort of uh, uh, looked at the various cities or if there's some overarching uh, governmental agency that collects that information, I'd be really interested to know that. I have one question really quick. Sure. Um, and we've talked about this in the past, but you know, working on the web or, or doing doing things on the web, and I know a lot of people here work on the webs as well. What kind of uh, tips do you have in terms of explaining what you do to your parents? Because that's a, <laughs> oh great, that's a tough one. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, my, my <laughs> I'll tell you, my parents uh, are are wonderfully still alive. That's great. Uh, they're you know in their mid eighties. And um, yeah, good luck. I don't think they've ever been able to understand exactly what I did. They're they're just happy that I appear in the newspaper once in a while, and uh, I've seemingly it's not in, in conjunction with any sort of indictment or what, whatever like that. So so they're uh, yeah they're very pleased, but they really I'm afraid don't have much of a clue. And I find this uh, to be true, and I'm sure 
people that are dealing a lot with the web, you know, you're at some party and they say, what do you do? And they, you start telling them their eyes glaze over and they have no concept. So fortunately, I have written some books and so people say, oh, you're an author. And so sure, okay, I'm an author. And then that, that's something they can grab onto. <laughs> that's funny. Then I guess, you know, we are we're running out running out of time here and I don't want to keep you uh, too long, but do you have any closing thoughts uh, or anything like that for the, the people here? Um, closing thoughts. I would, I, I guess I would say that uh, I think you're doing, everyone out there is doing themselves real service by getting on uh, a place like Edufire and learning more about um, uh, different people and different ideas. Uh, it's really an exciting time to be living right now. There's so many possibilities. There's a lot of frustrations. It's also a scary time. Um, even with relationships, uh, it's it's a challenging time. Uh, where, uh, as far as uh, uh, hooking up with with people and and uh, that special someone as well, and developing a long-term relationship. Um, I guess be courageous. Uh, try to be bold. Be smart. Uh, try to make yourself known out there. That's the biggest thing. Is is let people try to put things on the web. The wonderful thing is with uh, a search engine these days, is if you have something interesting, uh, the the brilliant people at Google will find your content and put it up there, and they will reward you accordingly th with with creative, uh, unique content. So be sure to put it up there and let people be able to find you and find out what your passion is. And um, try and pursue that. And uh, good luck to you. I know things are really tough out there. And um, uh, if there's some way I can help, be, feel free to email me. I'll try and look out for your email. And um, good luck to all of you. So I was using the cost of living calculator. That's a great one. Hmm. Cool. Yeah, we've got to build that out. So thank you so much, Bert. I really appreciate it. Coming on here. Oh, someone said here something, Jeremiah said something about doing things now versus doing things later, something like that. I know, it reminds me of, a, uh, of something I think about every once in a while. It's trite, but sometimes things that are trite. You know, we've all made mistakes in our, our life and we'll all put things off and I'm certainly more guilty, I think, than more people, uh, most people. But uh, the, the trite saying is, uh, when's the best time to plant a tree? Uh, or the best time to plant a tree was 30 years ago and the next best time to plant a tree is today. So hopefully that all of you know what your trees are and something you should be doing today and I hope that you'll find the time and the courage and the um, confidence to do it today and uh, and plant something special for yourself and everybody else. Great closing words. Yeah. Thank you again. Bye-bye.